Hello friends! Uh, this video will not be informative in the sense that the other videos were. I'm not covering new information, but I thought it would be helpful to offer a sort of informal review of the key takeaways that uh, my personal opinions on the key takeaways from the exhaustive literature review that I did and covered in this series of videos. Uh, please have a look down below at the blog post that accompanies this. It is a summary of, of the takeaways as well. And um, bear in mind that um, this is mostly my personal opinion and I think that you could have different takeaways depending on your perspective. So to summarize, we covered, um, as, we covered choline as a nutritional um, element we covered acetylcholine's role in the brain, and we covered how acetylcholine levels can be correlated to depression, as well as how they affect certain diseases like Alzheimer's disease. We also covered acetylcholinesterase as it relates to the breakdown of acetylcholine in the brain. And we discussed some pharmaceutical and herbal um, inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase, in addition to the uh, uh, ga uh, toxic gases that are irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Finally, we covered uh, the muscarinic cholinergic system, their genes, and some notable agonists, and we covered the same for the nicotinic cholinergic system. Now, the key takeaways that I believe uh, we have from this discussion are the following. First of all, it is important to be sure that your diet is not deficient in, in choline. And the reason why is because at the very least, we know that choline is an essential nutrient to prevent the progression of liver disease. Uh, a diet deficient in choline, that is deficient in the precursors to choline, will also cause, um, independently, will cause uh, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which will on its own progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is NASH. And this is a concern because about 25% of the world uh, already have NAFLD, and that's including children. Um, so imagine if we remove children from that segment of the world population, how high the levels would really be. Um, so the first thing is to make sure that your diet is not deficient in choline. Now, we discussed many complicating factors, and in the blog post you'll find below, I mentioned some of the genes that affect how you may require choline, uh, in more detail, but I don't go into too much detail because I found that the subject of methylation as well as choline requirements is quite extensively studied by people in the nutritional community and it has been discussed extensively on YouTube and I don't really have anything new to add to what they say, but I thought it was important to mention in line with the cholinergic system in general. Now second, in terms of acetylcholine's role in the brain, You'll recall that I discussed the 1972 hypothesis about the cholinergic adrenergic uh, hypothesis of depression. Now, although it's been overshadowed by the monoamine hypothesis of depression, uh, I do believe that it has some val validity, judging from personal experience with acetylcholine as well as the experience of some of my clients and my longstanding uh, involvement in co online communities uh, with regard to the subject. What I believe is that High, very high acetylcholine levels in the brain cause uh, a, at least an a, a anxiety effect, but may also cause a depressive effect in the long term. For this reason, I believe that it is questionable how optimal it is to um, agonize the cholinergic receptors through the indiscriminate neurotransmitter that is acetylcholine. And what I mean by indiscriminate is that acetylcholine agonizes all um, 23 receptor subtypes, uh, the muscarinic and nicotinic uh, receptor subtypes. And, you know, I don't know what its individual affinity, or nobody knows what its uh, different affinities are to the different receptors sub receptor subtypes exactly, but we do know that it agonizes all of them. There is no way that that is ideal. So while acetylcholine supplementation through the precursor GP, alpha GPC has been shown to improve cognition, and by the way, in general, when we talk about the cholinergic system's manipulation, we're mainly talking about attention and focus, um, especially towards externally driven uh, tasks. 
So while supplementation with alpha GPC has been shown to uh, actually improve physical performance, but also um, focus and attention, I I don't believe that it's the ideal molecule to use to supplement uh, in addition to the natural uh, nutritional requirements that relate to the uh, liver uh, health. Now, I still do recommend it to some people that because it is sort of low hanging fruit. If someone's diet is deficient in choline or if someone is not so interested in trying uh, more adventurous molecules, it may be the easiest thing that they can do. In that case, I recommend that you take lower doses of alpha GPC than what is commonly prescribed. I mean, not prescribed, but recommended. So commonly it's recommended to take 300 milligrams or so, if I recall correctly. And I believe that uh, 100 milligrams is usually sufficient. Uh, with that said, I also think that um, it may be uh, better to reversibly inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the brain. And the reason why is that the compounds that do this, some of the compounds that do this, also have some side benefits. So in particular, ginkgo biloba has a strong antioxidant effect and it is a potent uh, inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase as an enzyme. Also, by the way, the, another reason is this. Studies, I should have mentioned this. Another reason is this. Studies on uh, Alzheimer's disease patients who have a loss of cholinergic uh, neurons in the basal forebrain, they don't uh, tend to use acetylcholine supplementation. They tend to use the reversible inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase, and there is certainly a reason for that. So if, if acetylcholine supplementation on its own was sufficient, people would, uh, Alzheimer's disease patients would just be overdosing on acetylcholine. Now they do, there are studies in which Alzheimer's disease patients, or maybe not particularly them, I'm not quite sure if, if, if them, but people suffering from cognitive decline have used uh, heavy doses of acetylcholine, I mean very heavy, over a gram a day, of uh, alpha GPC, sorry. But uh, in general, it's the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are the ones that are shown to improve the cognition with Alzheimer's disease patients. So for this reason, I think, well, for that reason, as well as for the uh, side benefits of some of the herbal uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, I think it may be ideal to use them as opposed to alpha GPC. So for what I'm talking about particularly is, as I said, ginkgo biloba, which has a strong antioxidant effect, as well as uh, berberine, which has uh, wonderful effects on AMP kinase as well as the PCSK9 protein, which are, which are minor but still uh, desirable, and palmitine, which has been shown to be toxic to prostate cancer cells in vitro. So the combination of ginkgo biloba, berberine, and palmitine, which berberine and palmitine have already been studied synergistically together for this purpose, that combination, I think, would be probably a better way to increase acetylcholine levels in the brain in the long term than just supplementing with alpha GPC. That's what I would personally do. And in general, I don't, uh, I'm not as against doing that. I just think that acetylcholine supplementation directly, I'm not, I, I'm not a great fan of it. Now, in terms of the muscarinic uh, receptor agonists, I believe that the Vanderbilt University molecule, which is uh, VU0364572, uh, that is the last one that I mentioned in the series, is very attractive. It agonizes the M1 receptor without having any known effect on the dopaminergic system, which is key. And as I've mentioned before, I believe that uh, selectivity with these molecules is ideal. We do not want to be influencing particularly receptors that downregulate as quickly as the dopaminergic, uh, the dopamine receptors do. So this Vanderbilt University molecule is not in production. However, uh, and I'm not advising anyone do this, although it's not a controlled substance, but uh, one uh, tool one can use is that, uh, you know, most of these research chemical companies in the US, all they really do is they go on the owners of the companies, they go on Alibaba, which is a company that uh, provides a resource for Chinese manufacturers to contact Western buyers mainly. Um, and they, they find a, 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 a pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutically capable chemical plant that will make uh, chemical formulations for them. And they bottle it and sell it to the public here. Um, usually they don't actually even get the uh, chemicals tested by a third party. Usually the lab will just provide them with a test. 
you don't really have to go through these guys to decide what you can use or can't use because if you go on Alibaba yourself, you'll find the exact same research chemicals at much cheaper prices done by reliable labs or somewhat reliable, as, as reliable uh, as Chinese labs can get really. And if you speak to these labs, in general, they will be willing to try to create different formulations for you. So I think it's uh, very possible that one could have the Vanderbilt University chemical uh, created for them if they wanted to try agonizing the M1 receptor selectively. Now the reason why I think that may be attractive is because as I said earlier, I'm not particularly keen on using acetylcholine as a, neurotrans as a supplement, I mean as alpha GPC, as the precursor of uh, acetylcholine as a supplement, and therefore my uh, bias is to use uh, nicotine which I'll get into in a second. But nicotine doesn't agonize the M1 receptor and we are almost completely certain that the M1 receptors, agonizing the M1 receptor can yield cognitive benefits, particularly in terms of focus and attention. Um, and also it may yield uh, side benefits like things on the liver, so on. So in terms of ni uh, the nicotinic cholinergic uh, receptor agonists, um, basically I covered for you guys some agonists that are uh, naturally inspired which um, selectively agonize nic nic nicotinic receptor subclasses, assortments of nic nicotinic receptor subclasses in a way that's different from nicotine. You'll recall that nicotine primarily agonizes uh, or with, with greatest affinity agonizes the alpha 4 beta 2 receptors. Um, now here's my view on this. There are a lot of chemicals being created for this purpose but I don't really know why they're being, I mean, it's always great to try to improve upon something, but we know that nicotine has some very unique qualities and I'm not sure that we, as, as practitioners, not as, as you know, research people, if you're, if you're researching, you always wanna find something better, but to be practical, I'm not sure we know of any reason that we need to change uh, the nicotine's uh, chemical effects. In particular, nicotine exerts a, an effect on the nicotinic cholinergic receptors that cause it to upregulate. Those receptors upregulating is a good thing. Second of all, and I'm not sure that all the other agonists may have that effect. Second of all, nicotine uh, has been shown to exert an antidepressant effect that is not, uh, that does not and it does not create a, a tolerance to that. Like it, the antidepressant effect is chronic. Uh, it also uh, exerts a chronic and sustained effect on attention and focus. So for this reason, with such extensive studies, I'm 30 years of studies on animals and on humans, I feel that nicotine is a better chemical to, to use to stimulate the cholinergic system than alpha-GPC is. Additionally, I find, although I won't go into too much detail about this, but SSRIs, which I mentioned earlier, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they also cause, uh, an, they cause an antagonism of these same receptors, which likely causes an upregulation of those receptors. Now, I, I use SSRIs for a different purpose, but I find that the combination of nicotine with SSRIs is particularly synergistic. And this is just speculation on my part, but I, as you may have heard from my theory on why, um, on the adri uh, cholinergic adrogenic uh, hypothesis of depression, why there's some con uh, conflicting evidence about that. I think that nicotine and SSRIs may both cause an upregulation of nicotinic cholinergic receptors, which may be a good thing. And now in the form of nicotine gum, uh, there is very little to be concerned about. But personally, I have uh, admittedly used uh, a Swedish tobacco product at times because I find it to be quite pleasurable. It's called snus. Now, snus has been tied to pancreatic uh, cancer uh, development. And, however, I'm not sure how robust that really is. Uh, but it has not been tied to oral cancer development to my knowledge. This is a little surprising because it still contains the compounds I mentioned before, NNN and NNK which are carcinogenic and have a great affinity to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. But, you know, probably I'm going to eventually stop using snus. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I am going to, but I like snus. Um, but if you, if you have never used it, I would not encourage you to begin using tobacco because it, is, it, it has been shown very robustly that nicotine is the chemical that we're concerned about, not the other elements of tobacco. So, in conclusion, personally, my uh, approach to this is to use nicotine 
and to use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, a reversible, obviously reversible <laughs> acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. I'm not using sarin gas, but uh, specifically ginkgo, berberine, and palmitine. Uh, I find that they have a synergistic effect together. I uh, am very curious about uh, agonizing the M1 receptor, although I have not done so yet. And I may report to you guys at a later date how that has gone when I've tried it. Uh, for now, that's all I have to say about the cholinergic system. I hope you guys benefited from this and that you uh, have success in your own efforts at cognitive enhancement. And uh, please leave a comment down below if you liked the video, let me know if you have any suggestions for how I could improve the next uh, video series which will be on the serotonergic system. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Have a great day. Thank you for watching.